Um, our third speaker in the session this morning is Ben Russell. Uh, Ben's known to many. He's an expat Aussie, uh, and he's currently, and and I presume that's not a temporary thing, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Rabobank New Zealand. Uh, he joined Rabobank in 2004, moved to New Zealand in 2006 uh, to lead the New Zealand country banking team. Uh, Rabobank's New Zealand business is focused on the food and agri sectors across 32 branches and 300 staff. And prior to taking that role, Ben was the head of food and agribusiness research and advisory. Uh, before joining Rabobank, Ben worked for Meat and Livestock Australia as a research and development portfolio manager for the New South Wales Farmers Association as a Wool and Livestock Policy Director and at the University of New South Wales as a postdoctorate fellow in Merino Breeding and Genetics. He has a BSc Honours and a PhD from the University of New South Wales and he now lives in Wellington, New Zealand with his wife and three children. Um, so uh, to round off our Cook's tour of uh, world uh, farm financing models, please welcome Ben Russell from New Zealand. Thanks, Mick. Um, I just want to kick off by apologising to uh, the vast majority of corporate agribusiness reps in the room that I almost certainly offended by calling you all co poor corporate citizens. Um, it's fair to say that didn't quite come out right. Um, but uh, it was a very broadly based statement and uh, there are plenty of good corporate agri uh, citizens uh, out there. So um, having got that mere culprit out of the way. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, farm financing in New Zealand. I know um, there's quite a lot of interest in the New Zealand agri sector in Australia. New Zealand has been a rapidly developing sector. There are a lot of New Zealand investors who come out um, into Australia and other countries and uh, uh, some interesting models. I think um, the thing about New Zealand agri, it, it exists in an environment which is uh, where climatically it's uh, certainly more reliable than Australia. You don't get the volatility in, in rainfall, <coughs> that means that farmers can push their enterprises harder um, and it does mean generally that they have a tendency to take on a bit more debt. Um, so that's allowed the sector to expand quite rapidly but it does carry with it uh, certain risks um, and I'll get on to some of those uh, during, the, uh, during the talk. <coughs> um, what I'm mainly going to focus on though is the way that the New Zealand dairy industry in particular has developed structures and uh, options for younger farmers to work their way through the system and to build equity uh, in viable farming businesses. And I think it's particularly a feature of the New Zealand dairy sector rather even than other New Zealand sectors where they don't quite have those same structures. But I think there's some things that are, are quite useful for that for other, uh, other sectors. So um, the quick version. Um, Essentially, well-established farmers don't have any trouble raising debt finance in New Zealand. It's a very competitively uh, banked sector um, uh, and it's very well priced. I noticed there was a comment earlier about the pricing of debt. Essentially, New Zealand farmers borrow at similar spreads to uh, mortgage borrowers in New Zealand. So it's a highly competitive uh, banking sector. I think more problematic is getting younger farmers a start. <laughs> Uh, and all farmers, uh, farmers by definition are an ageing demographic and so getting younger farmers into the sector is challenging in New Zealand. I think it's challenging everywhere but um, very high land values. Um, but as I said earlier there's been some innovative structures developed um, within the country and I'll elaborate on some of those. I'll talk briefly about foreign investment. Um, the foreign investment regime is actually quite challenging uh, in terms of um, there's a lot of uh, hurdles to, to get over. It's not um, uh, like Australia where I think there's a, there's a cap at uh, some very high value under which you don't need any foreign um, investment approval. In New Zealand uh, it's basically five hectares so you need um, government approval for purchase of land over five hectares and that, um, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, regime exists however um, you can work your way through it. It's not impassable and there are some pretty serious players uh, taking a stake in New Zealand farming assets. And um, just uh, last thing uh, I'll um, briefly cover is just uh, again I heard some earlier comments about um, innovative financial products and I don't want to make the same mistake I made with my earlier comment um, but uh, I think generally farmers should be cautious about um, products 
that involve mezzanine or uh, leveraged or structured finance because um, basically uh, you know, too much debt in a business uh, can, can create plenty of problems. So well used, it's, uh, it's okay. So um, firstly, a bit of an overview of New Zealand agriculture. That's, uh, sorry, that's the Rabo Bank world. Um, and the only reason, apart from the very quick corporate ad, uh, is the dark countries are where New Zealand, um, Rabo Bank has uh, uh, banking operations, which is primarily food and agri related. Um, but every country is different. Uh, every country is quite different. And uh, we have a banking operation in Brazil uh, it's, it's very different there to in the US or Australia and New Zealand. So, um, and I think um, you know, picking up um, things that work well in uh, some countries and trying to transport them to others sometimes works, but uh, often it doesn't. Um, New Zealand agriculture. Agriculture is uh, the dominant uh, economic sector in New Zealand. It's only about 8% of GDP, but it's just under 60% of merchandise expo exports. So it's um, and it really drives the economic growth of the whole country. So um, a lot of New Zealanders don't like to acknowledge that, but um, more, than, more so than in Australia, agriculture dominates uh, the, the economy. And when agriculture is going well, the economy is going well. When agriculture is under pressure, it really slows down. So to some extent, there's a little bit of a natural hedge there with the currency. Um, if, uh, if the New Zealand uh, dairy sector went through a major trauma when it's been through a few, you actually find the currency tracks that pretty well. Currency almost, if you put up a graph of milk price and currency, you'd see there's a reasonable correlation. So again, that's um, a little bit of a natural hedge. It's not perfect, but, um, but it is a critical sector for, for the whole uh, New Zealand economy. Um, that graph is probably a bit hard to see, but um, in the last 20 years, essentially the dairy industry has expanded at the expense of the meat industry, the sheep and beef industry. So on the left, um, the yellow, um, where you see yellow replaced with red, that's uh, dairy f uh, sheep and beef farms replaced with uh, dairy farms. And uh, so half a million hectares of land has come out of sheep and beef uh, and about 280,000 of that has gone into dairy uh, and others gone into forestry or other sort of change. But the meat industry in New Zealand has been uh, reducing in size over a very long period of time and that, um, that uh, movement is continuing. Uh, even this year, um, the, the ewe kill in the South Island of New Zealand is up 20% on last year and that's primarily people selling their capital stock and either converting to dairy or converting to some sort of dairy support uh, with their land. So it's been massive change. Um, and so the dairy industry has risen uh, in prominence. Um, New Zealand dairy is very competitive globally. Historically, it was a very low cost producer on farm. Um, over time, uh, the cost structures have built up in New Zealand, um, partially at least uh, driven by significant land appreciation, value of land. And from an on-farm production perspective, New Zealand dairy is now not the cheapest producer in the world. Um, our food and agri-research uh, team, uh, Luke Chandler is here from, uh, who heads up that team, but their analysis shows uh, that New Zealand's sort of roughly in the middle of, of global uh, dairy exporters in terms of on-farm production. But the advantage New Zealand still has is a very efficient and strong route to market via primarily Fonterra. Um, and the whole industry is set up for commodity milk production. And so they're very efficient at sucking the water out of their milk, putting it into um, a package and shipping it off to different commodity markets. And that route to market is very efficient. So, um, but the, the industry is globally competitive um, and it's grown significantly. I think um, just, uh, and I could sp you could spend a whole day on this topic, but um, there's some pretty serious environmental issues that are building up in New Zealand, particularly around water quality and, and the impact of nitrogen primarily and also phosphorus uh, on water quality in New Zealand's not only the iconic lakes like Lake Taupo but also a lot of the rivers. Um, and so that is an issue which is, um, uh, is, is going to lead to changes in farming systems over the next 10 or 20 years in New Zealand. And, um, I think the industry is going to have to adapt a lot of its farming systems uh, in order to manage that issue. And, and they will. I mean, the New Zealand dairy industry is very adaptable. Uh, it's, it's a proven performer in that regard. Um, just a few words on rural banking. I know um, there's uh, a lot of the banks um, have got representatives here today. Essentially, 
the New Zealand banking sector is owned by Australian banks. Um, the, the New Zealand banks uh, were all sold to the Australian banks in the late 80s and early 90s. There was a view there that um, <coughs> the country didn't need to own its own banking sector. I think it's fair to say that was wrong. Uh, but um, the Bank of New Zealand um, uh, went, came very close to going broke uh, in, the, in the late 80s and early 90s and I think the government got, got terrified at the concept of having to pile a huge amount of money in to prop it up. Uh, and so they allowed all of the uh, major New Zealand banks to be purchased by the Australian banks. So ANZ is obviously owned by ANZ, Westpac is owned by Westpac, ASB, Auckland Savings Bank is owned by the Commonwealth Bank and BNZ is owned by the National Australia Bank. And those banks together with Rabobank dominate the rural finance scene in New Zealand. So they make up 96% of uh, loans to farmers and the other 4% is primarily second tier or livestock financing. So. Um, I think the other thing about rural banking in New Zealand is um, it's a very big part of the bank's business. So for Rabo, it's 86% it's of our business, right? So that's all we do. Um, but somewhat atypically, I think, for the major Aussie banks, um, it makes up between 10 and 20% of their loan book. And they're, they're all finance players in, in New Zealand. They, um, they have retail and corporate markets. They bank the whole economy. Um, but Agri is really, generally speaking, the second largest individual sector after home mortgages for the, uh, the Aussie banks in New Zealand. So it's very important to them. And without, without wanting to be um, too positive about my competitors, they actually, by and large, do a pretty good job. They're very attentive to customer needs. Uh, and it's, as I said earlier, it's very, very competitive. I think one of the unintended consequences of that is that the, the amount of leverage that builds up into the system can be quite high and I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, just under there, uh, there's a, some typical rural lending parameters uh, in terms of uh, loan to security ratio and interest coverage ratio um, and, and they're what I think are sort of uh, typical. Some banks push it a, a little harder but um, uh, you know, a dairy owner operator, 60 to 65 percent loan to security ratio is not that uncommon. Um, and, uh, and, and I think part of that is driven by the reliability of the farming system. So uh, when I first went to New Zealand and I'd spent a bit of time with the bank here in Australia, um, you know, farmers and, and bank managers would be talking about a terrible year if milk production was 10% under sort of the long-term average, right? So, or costs would might have been 10% higher. So um, uh, I thought in Australia that's sort of well within the zone of a good normal year. So, uh, but. But because the systems have got a bit more gearing behind them, there is that, I think, slightly less flexibility in terms of ability to handle you know, two or three uh, down years in a row. So, um, New Zealand has uh, 51 billion of agricultural debt. It's quite closely tracked by the Reserve Bank. And dairy accounts for 64% of that. So, um, you know, the... Uh, uh, and, and that's where the growths come from and a lot of that has gone into uh, funding dairy conversions but um, and the debt is uh, reasonably highly concentrated among larger farmers and it's similar patterns to what I think we've seen in Australia, maybe a little more so. Um, so uh, and debt servicing is on average about 20% of farm income, that's not too different to some of the figures that were put up there before. About 15% of farmers have got less than 30% equity and they're farmers where, um, you know, a couple of tough years, uh, they're going to find their their equity pretty quickly gets down to very, very low levels. And that's, that's the... So people say the New Zealand agriculture has a debt problem. I think um, that's uh, a bit broad. I think some farmers have a debt problem, a relatively small percentage, and it's about having the flexibility to get through those, uh, those tougher years. Certainly dairy debt is on the radar of the Reserve Bank in New Zealand, the primary um, prudential regulator. Uh, they monitor it very closely, they talk to the banks about it. And um, if you, this is a really busy slide, but um, it's just a little bit of the history. The blue, the blue, uh, I think this, does that work? Yeah, the blue line here, that, that shows the build up of aggregate debt in New Zealand farms, and particularly uh, what I too call, like to call two years of madness, uh, 2007 and 2008 aggregate debt in New Zealand went up by $12 billion in two years. And you'll see the, the orange line is farm incomes and they sort of didn't go up much. Uh, they certainly didn't go up anywhere near as rapidly. So these years here from the early 2000s through to 2009, 
rural debt went up by 14% per annum, but actual farm incomes only went up by 2%. And that, is, that created what we call in the game a bubble. And um, then the global financial crisis hit in 2008. Um, farm incomes went down. There was quite a reduction in dairy commodity values. So, um, but farmers had just taken on 12 billion of extra debt. So the colour drained out of the faces of a lot of farmers and, uh, and even more bankers uh, over that time. And, and that was, um, that was uh, a, a period of a lot of financial stress in the sector. Um, and you can see here, this is um, rural land values roughly tracked over the same time. So this debt built up, um, there was a lot of debt, a lot of farmers were borrowing, they were acquiring land, doing conversions, land values were going up. And you can see that this is a track of uh, land values. These, this is Canterbury um, irrigated dairy farms. But you can see that real quite sharp increase in values over that 07 to 08 period. Then the global financial crisis hit. Um, uh, farm incomes fell and liquidity dried up. Banks Liquidity actually became quite tight uh, in, in, uh, among some of the banks and banks became more reluctant to lend. And so farms became very, very hard to sell and those that did sell, you can see the reduction in values sort of 09, 2009, 2010. So there was probably a 20 to 30% correction in the value of dairy farms in New Zealand over that time, just after there was 12 billion of extra debt in the system. And really I think um, the thing that kept the industry going was two things. One is um, obviously government, um, central banks drove interest rates down, so the debt servicing cost actually didn't go up. Um, uh, it, it probably stayed flat, reasonably flat. But secondly, the dairy industry recovered quite quickly in terms of commodity prices and, and farmers had a couple of tougher years, but then prices rebounded quite quickly. And to be fair, I think China um, played a huge role in that and China bought a, started to really increase their buying of New Zealand milk powder. And, that, and so the industry's recovered and the last couple of years um, have been much more sensible. So you can see since 2009, debt levels have stayed reasonably stable. So they've gone up, tracked up at about 2% per annum, um, but actually farm incomes have grown quite strongly. They've grown at sort of 9% per annum. And farmers and bankers got very, very focused on good cash returns uh, out of farming businesses. Um, I think in this lead up, it was a bit of a gold rush. It was uh, get your hands on as much land as you can because it's gonna be worth 10% more next year than it was when you bought it. Um, that became apparent that that wasn't an ever, um, you know, a, a one-way path to heaven. And when they corrected, farmers and bankers got very focused on driving cash returns out of, out of farms. And that has turned into a much more um, sustainable position. There's still a fair amount of uh, leverage in the system, um, but I think the industry by and large is much better positioned now than it was, say, back in 08, 09. So that's... Um, that's a sort of a bit of an um, overview of the banking um, scene in New Zealand. Rural banking, farmers are very well banked um, and uh, the industry's developed quite quickly, but there are some risks uh, that, that go along with that. I just want to talk now about some of the f um, structures that um, New Zealand farmers and banks have used to sort of try and continue to bring new people in now. Um, unlike, uh, like mo I think most other countries, certainly Australia and, and the US, um, we have an ageing demographic of farmers. This is some work that we've done recently, um, which essentially uh, shows that a very small percentage, the, 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 um, uh, this is the, the time, a very small percent, percentage of farmers have um, succession plans in place. So uh, around about 60% of New Zealand farmers would like to bring their children, sons and daughters into the farming business in the next 10 years. So that's uh, these percentage, um, but very few. The, the dark blue line is the percentage of those that actually have somewhat of a plan, uh, somewhat documented and, and planned way to do it. Uh, so lots of farmers would like their kids to come into the farm, but it's probably 80% of them don't really, can't, it, it's, it's a real struggle for them as to how they're actually going to do that. And so um, this, is, uh, this is an issue. I think it's um, something that the, the there are some structures that I just want to go through that I think um, they're not necessarily making it um, easy to do. It's still quite hard to do, but um, I think there are some, some good ideas in here. So these are, these are the models that operate. So this is your basic owner-operated model, and in each of these, 
I've sort of looked at uh, the parameters around a larger scale um, family farming or a larger scale unit. So 800 cows, quite a big unit in New Zealand. You would need around about 10 million. That would be a, a business valued at around about 10 million in, in assets. Um, was uh, David's talk earlier on corporate agribusiness. Um, we don't have as much corporate agribusiness in Australia, at least with um, institutional investors, but we do, um, in my view, the most efficient unit is still a good large-scale family-owned uh, business um, where uh, the people who own the business are the ones working in the business. Uh, they're very flexible. They know their business very well. They're obviously very committed to it. Uh, and that, that model is still the dominant model in New Zealand. Um, 65 per cent of dairy herds um, are owner operated and um, the vast majority of farms are, are um, you know, owned by the people who, who work on them. Now, so that's a good model but it's, um, and it's straightforward to finance. Um, banks finance it. They, um, they, these businesses can handle, good performing businesses can handle up to 60 per cent debt, um, perhaps a little more. Um, and they're relatively straightforward. The challenge is um, what younger farmer has got in this case around about five million of equity to bring to the table to, to buy mum and dad out and that, that's where the challenge uh, exists. And so New Zealand over the years has developed the share milking system um, and, and this, is, uh, this is not particularly novel but I think what's novel about it is the extent to which it is an important plank of New Zealand farming. Uh, so around about 35% of New Zealand dairy herds are milked by share milkers. Uh, around half of those are what we call 50-50 share milkers, which where they, they actually own the cows. And then you also have lower order share milkers where uh, they don't own the cows, but they employ the staff, um, they pay some of the operating costs, and they, they generally have skin in the game. Um, and in this, in this model, um, and again, all these are sort of based around about a $10 million asset um, a business. But the, uh, the share milker owns the stock um, and he owns some plant. Generally the landowner, so I'm pointing at something you can't see, the landowner um, owns the land and the shares. Um, uh, and, and the share milker has their own equity and can raise their own debt independently of the landowner. So uh, we and all the other banks in New Zealand will finance share milkers on a, on a standalone basis. Sometimes they have supporting guarantees from the landowner, but mostly they don't, mostly they're standalone. Uh, sustainable businesses and so the landowner also has his own debt um, and uh, and equity uh, they work together and um, generally they'll commit to say a two or three year contract and um, often share milkers will at the end of that contract will pick up their cows and they'll go to another farm so it's not necessarily a, a super long-term binding arrangement sometimes it is um, and in fact um, uh, last Friday and today are what is known in New Zealand as Gypsy Day because it's the time of year where most dairy farm purchases change hands and settlement occurs and a lot of uh, share milkers pick up their cows and move on to the next uh, farm that they've got a, a contract on. So, um, sorry. Uh, so it's, um, it's a good system. Um, the industry really celebrates their share milkers. Um, these people up here are the uh, 2014 share milkers of the year. There's a huge industry sort of awards uh, ceremony. Um, and uh, the industry does a lot to try and cultivate share milkers and bring them th through the system. Um, so that system works, but even to buy, um, say, a, a herd of cows of 800 is, is a couple of million bucks uh, these days. So that's actually quite, still quite a big investment. And to get to a 50-50 share milking job, you need to build up quite a bit of equity. The other model which has developed in New Zealand, um, which I think is less prevalent here in Australia, is, is the equity partnerships model. Now, um, it's, there's no rocket science behind this. This is just pooled equity by a number of, um, a number of equity partners. Um, largely they're farmers, so often an equity partner is a farmer with his own family farm um, and they put equity into another um, uh, equity partnership or sometimes it's outside investors uh, from, from other industries. And uh, they all pool equity, uh, form a company or a partnership, the company or partnership borrows uh, to help finance and 100% of the income and 100% of the costs um, accrue to the company and, and it's just like a shareholding business. Um, it's very common uh, this and often in larger scale and some of the largest scale businesses in New Zealand are equity partnerships and um, I'll give you an example of one in a moment. Uh, they do tend to take on a bit less debt, they need to retain a bit more flexibility, um, governance is really important and one of the challenges for them is liquidity on exit. So 
Uh, it's quite hard to sell a minority share in a farm. Uh, there's not a lot of, it's not a particularly liquid market. So, and there are some companies like my farm, uh, there are companies that set up to sort of facilitate these and they're looking at options to try and get people out of these a bit more easily. Um, but by and large, it's been a pretty good um, system. And what is particularly good about it is there's a foot in the door for the equity manager. Uh, so you can see, sorry, I keep pointing that one. Um, the manager partner is, I mean, the, the, a successful, a feature of the successful ones is that the manager of the business has equity. And, and often it's a relatively small stake of equity. It might be five or ten percent. But they actually have equity, they're one of the equity partners and they're also the salaried manager of the business. So again, they've got skin in the game, their, their interests are well aligned with the interests of the other equity partners. So again, it's a good mechanism to pool equity, um, to get younger people in, into with a foothold in a, in a good scale company and, and away they go. And so just the last iteration on this because even, again, you look at say, um, uh, somebody, uh, an equity partner might need to bring half a million of equity to get a 9 or 10% share in. That's still a chunk of money. So um, a model that we financed the other day, um, uh, which is even more complicated, and they look quite complicated there, actually not that complicated, is uh, essentially separating uh, the landowning company from the operating company. Um, the landowner, again, um, has his own equity and debt raises independent financing there. Uh, the operating company, which uh, the landowner is sort of the, the primary partner in, but may allow the, the manager into the operating company. And that is also a financeable transaction because they've got security of cows and shares and stock. Um, that company is uh, designed to produce as much profit as possible. Uh, it pays a lease payment back to the landowner. So the landowner's got his investment in the land, but he's also benefiting from the, the profit out of the operating company. And the, the advantage here is that you can bring in the manager on as little um, equity as he's got. I mean, if he's got nothing, you can still put him on as an equity partner. He can earn his way in. He can, he can take his dividends or his share of the profits um, and get started. And again, it's sort of a way to sort of build up, but each of those entities is bankable standalone. Again, from a banker's point of view, we'd rather have a bit of collateral coming back here, but it is bankable standalone um, uh, if there's some equity going in to start with. So, so some of these are, uh, are options for the industry. And these different models can actually fit together quite well. So um, this is an example of uh, the Dairy Holdings Group, um, and I've got their um, permission to put this information up. Uh, this is the biggest dairy farming group in New Zealand. It's uh, what you might regard as a, a corporate farm. Uh, they own about 70 farms in New Zealand. They uh, milk about uh, 50,000 cows or 43,000 cows, uh, produce 15 million kilos of milk solids. And they actually have a mix of all of these different um, enterprise types. So Dairy Holdings is owned, it's an equity partnership. There's uh, essentially four shareholding groups. Uh, these people are all farmers. They've all got their own farms. Um, they've, they've invested in... Uh, in dairy holdings over many years. So they own all of the land and they um, own uh, most of the cows or a lot of the cows. But within that, and they've got farms all over the South Island of New Zealand, but within that they have um, essentially managed farms. They only have four managed farms out of 72 where they employ the manager uh, as, a, as an employee. Um, majority of the farms are either contract milked where the, the person running the farm gets a, a dollar a kilo or whatever it is so he's, again, his interests are aligned to produce as many kilos. Uh, and then they've got lower order share milkers and uh, share milkers with cows. So about 25 of the farms uh, are share milkers of some description. So it um, looks complex, um, but um, what they do is they, they, the key success factor for them is getting good people on the farms and keeping those people for the longer term. That's how they make money. Uh, and the best way to do that is to give them some form of share of the profits and that's how the share milking uh, model works. And so um, uh, it's, it's a good system. Um, it takes a bit of getting it set up. They can be quite hard to get out of, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different model. And it's, it's meant that um, a lot of the equity to grow New Zealand agribusiness comes from farmers within the country. So. Um, and, and they get the benefits of scale uh, without ne necessarily needing to leverage themselves uh, too highly. So, um, Just a few comments on um, overseas investment. Uh, 
Only about 3% of New Zealand farmland is foreign owned. Um, as I said earlier, any, any investment more than five hectares requires overseas investment off, office approval. So um, that's, uh, and the government, <coughs> there's a fair amount of room there for the overseas investment office to approve or decline applications. Um, there's a good character test and there's a, another test which is a substantial and identifiable net benefit to New Zealand, which can mean just about anything. So, um, so it is a barrier, but um, uh, companies, and there have been some notable recent investors, uh, Shanghai Penjing is obviously a Chinese company who purchased uh, the Crafer farms in the North Island. There were 16 farms that went into receivership. They came in and purchased those farms, and they recently purchased uh, another 10 or so farms in the South Island. So that group's now, I think, about the second largest dairy farming group in New Zealand. Um, so they've gone through the process quite legally. A um, few super funds here, Harvard Endowment Fund in particular, uh, Aquila Capital is a, um, a fund manager. Uh, James Cameron, who is a famous Hollywood director, is also a New Zealand dairy farmer. He's got about $20 million uh, worth of dairy farms and some private investors. But it's not as prominent, in my view, in New Zealand foreign investment. Um, the industry is really divided on whether it's a good or bad thing. I think largely aligned to whether you're a buyer or a seller of assets. Uh, I think if you're a buyer, you're probably pretty opposed to it. And if you're a seller, you think it's a great thing. Um, but uh, it is a different regime to what operates in Australia. And I think the government has taken a conscious effort to try and just maintain a bit more control over who, who ends up buying uh, foreign investment. So the message is, I think, the government like to send is, uh, we're open for business depending on who you are. And, um, so, uh, but um, that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say, except for one last thing. I don't think, I said earlier about innovative financial products. Um, I, I wasn't meaning to necessarily say there are, there are no good innovative financial products, but where they involve leverage, um, leverage finance, um, subordinated debt, mezzanine finance, or other sort of structures, which are essentially debt uh, that needs to be at some point serviced and repaid, Farmers in New Zealand, by and large, can borrow enough debt uh, to, to service their, their businesses or to set their businesses up. The challenge, to my way of thinking, is really about how do you get equity coming into those businesses so equity can come in and leave. And as David Sackett said earlier, how do you align the interests of the equity with the interests of management of the businesses? And that's getting that aligned. And I think New Zealand has got some systems that align that reasonably well. Um, is, uh, is how to, uh, to make it work very successfully. So um, knowledge and capability and motivation for young people to get into farming is, is still the best, um, the, the, the best tool. And uh, just this week in the Netherlands, uh, Rabobank's assembled about 50 young farmers under 40 from around the world. Um, there's about six New Zealand farmers and about six uh, Australian farmers and plenty of other countries to get together and, and work out how do we get more young people into farming. Uh, and um, there's some very, very successful young farmers in among that group, and we're certainly hoping to learn from them. So, anyway, thanks uh, very much, and um, yeah.